for coming tonight. And uh, I got a lot of material I'm going to shoot through in a big hurry. So uh, if I leave you scratching your head, I'll be around to answer questions afterwards as best I can. And uh, anyway, I'll just uh, get underway with entrepreneurs, promoters, and visionaries to struggle to build a railroad to Red Lodge, Bear Creek, and Cook City. Uh, the four main topics I'm going to hit on this evening are uh, the initial unsuccessful efforts to build a railroad to Cook City via Yellowstone National Park. Then I'll talk a little bit about subsequent proposals that were made between 1886 and 87 to reach Cook City without going through the park. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the struggle to get a railroad here into uh, Red Lodge here during 1888 89. And then I'll finish up with some comments about <clears throat> the continuing efforts to get a railroad to both Bear Creek and Cook City between 1890 and uh, 1903. So I'd like to start this uh, talk with uh, this guy, Jeff uh, Stanford. He was a uh, prospector and an explorer. He started off in uh, uh, California gold rush country, spent some time in Mexico, and uh, by the 1860s had found his way up to Montana. Uh, in 1866, uh, he put together an expedition that was going to go from uh, about Bozeman and follow the mountain front uh, through past Red Lodge here, uh, looking for gold. Uh, it was a big expedition. He put together about 100 guys uh, to uh, lead that expedition. It was pretty wild country back then. And uh, the bigger your group, the safer you're going to be. One of the guys that joined him was this guy, uh, James George. Uh, he was an itinerant prospector at the time. Uh, had had uh, come up to Montana in the 1860s, and in 1866, he was still hoping to strike it rich somewhere. Uh, he was part of Stanford's group, and, uh, and he's the guy that's generally credited with discovering the Red Lodge Bear Creek coal field here. This guy, about four years after uh, uh, James George made his discovery of the coal field, uh, Adam Horn Miller is the guy who's credited with discovering a, a polymetallic uh, mineral deposit near the northeast, well, what would be the northeast corner of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, that would be called the New World Mining District. Uh, gold, silver, copper, uh, lead principally up in that area. So there were two major discoveries made, late 1860s, early 1870s in this area. And uh, this is the situation as it looked back then. And this is a map I'll come back to uh, from time to time. Let me get my little pointer going here. Uh, um, so I'll come back to this map. Um, as you can see here, Bozeman on one side and Billings up in this corner. Uh, the state line, just for reference, and then the original squared off boundaries of uh, Yellowstone National Park as it looked in 1872. So the problem that uh, both uh, George and uh, Horn Miller's discoveries had was that uh, the Laramie Treaty of 1868 put the entire shaded area there on the map in the Crow Indian Reservation. So uh, technically, uh, development uh, wasn't allowed within them. Uh, of course, that didn't really stop people. Uh, miners poured into the Cook City, the New World Mining uh, District, and, uh, through the 1870s. And uh, by 1880, things were getting kind of tense uh, between the Crow tribe and the miners up there at Cook City. The federal government started to worry about an outbreak of violence in the area as a result of that. And so they negotiated a treaty with the Crow to a seed part of their reservation back to the government. And uh, that, that treaty was uh, signed in, in 1860 and ratified by the Senate in 18, uh, 1862. So you can see the area that was removed from reservation control at that point. And, uh, and you can see that one of the main efforts uh, in making that uh, session by the Crow tribe was to get Red Lodge and Cook City out of reservation lands so that, uh, so that they could be developed more fully.
Uh, then enters this guy, this is Henry Villard, but uh, the, the back story on Henry is that uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, had begun construction of a northern transcontinental line in the late 1860s, starting in Duluth, Minnesota, and they were building west. And uh, they made it as far as Bismarck, uh, what would be Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, in 1873 when their promoter, a guy named Jay Cook, uh, went into financial trouble and the whole operation <clears throat> went into bankruptcy. The uh, Northern Pacific uh, was stalled there at Bismarck then from uh, 1873 until about uh, 1879 when a guy named Frederick Billings came in and started reorganizing and get the company, getting the company's finances straightened out. Uh, Billings started, was able to get the railroad moving west again in about 1880, and they started laying track again and heading west from there. And in 1881, Henry Villard came in and took control of the NP, and uh, he pushed it through to completion. They, uh, <clears throat> he had construction going on in both directions, from Washington going east, and and Dakota going west, and they finally uh, completed the railroad in September of 1883, uh, driving a golden spike up near Garrison at a place called Independence Creek, which is now called Gold Creek. But uh, so this is this was Henry's background. But but Villard got in trouble. He he overextended himself on the, the railroad in the process of pushing it through to completion. And by the time the railroad was done. Uh, in 1883, Villard was uh, pretty much bankrupt, and so was the railroad. So uh, he lost control of the company at that point. But uh, well, what he did accomplish was that in 1882 and 83, the Northern Pacific built its way up the Yellowstone Valley, and uh, looked something like that. Um, the, one of the first branch lines that, that was built by the Northern Pacific was called the Park Branch. It was originally called the Rocky Mountain Railroad, but it was <clears throat> sold to the NP and became their park branch. Their, uh, their main goal there was to tap into uh, tourist traffic to Yellowstone National Park. That was completed in 1883, and as soon as it was completed, uh, they were still looking to extend it, and, and Cook City was their obvious target. Uh, the mining going on there uh, was, was uh, increasing at the time, and uh, they formed a subsidiary company called the Cinnabar and Clark's Fork Railroad. And uh, this guy, uh, Martin McGinnis, who was our territorial representative at the time, uh, took a bill to Congress to uh, grant the Northern Pacific's uh, subsidiary company a, a right of way through the National Park. Uh, what they, what McGinnis proposed was that. Uh, the uh, Cinnabar and Clark's Fork Railroad would build, uh, follow the Yellowstone River up through up the Lamar Valley and then, and then follow Sotomayor Creek into Cook City. Well, as might be expected, even back in the 1880s, this wasn't a real popular idea. Uh, as soon as this was brought up in Congress, there was an immediate uh, firestorm of opposition. Uh, conservationists didn't want uh, commercial development in the new national park. And uh, this ran into a, uh, a wall of opposition pretty quickly. Uh, so the MP decided to try a different tactic. And instead of asking for a right of way through the National Park, they proposed that, uh, that Congress agree to just remove part of the land in the park so that they wouldn't have to go through the park. And their, their argument was that there was really nothing in the northeast corner of the park to be protecting. There were no geysers up there and all that sort of stuff. So, but uh, this this didn't go very far uh, with the people in Washington either. So uh, by 1886, the Northern Pacific's plans were were pretty well stalled. But there were things going on in Cook City uh, after the uh, Crow session of 1882. Uh, things started to develop there. There was uh, more investment made. Uh, a new bigger smelter was was built up in Cook City uh, during that time, and uh, and so by 1886, uh, production had peaked. Uh, that year, they produced uh, 735,000 pounds of lead, 62,300 ounces of silver, 438 ounces of gold. Uh, 
current value at the time was 105,000. If you just convert that to 2022 dollars, that was 3.3 million. <clears throat> so it wasn't insignificant. It was enough to attract the attention of, uh, of other businessmen in the state. And one of those guys uh, was this guy, Philip M. Gallagher. Uh, Phil Gallagher was a uh, civil engineer. Uh, he had been born and raised in uh, southeast Pennsylvania, around Williamsport. Uh, he got his engineering degree at the Polytechnic College of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and then went to work for uh, a number of railroads doing surveying work. Uh, he eventually ended up in Leadville, Colorado, worked as a mining engineer for a little while, and then uh, uh, finally in the 1880s migrated up north to Montana. Um, Phil got together with a couple of other Billings businessmen and a couple of uh, East Coast investors, and uh, with the idea of tapping the, the activity in Cook City, uh, formed a company called the Billings Clark's Fork and Cook City Railroad. Railroad. Uh, that was in uh, March of 1886, they filed the <clears throat> incorporation papers. And uh, Gallagher's vision was to start a railroad in Billings and uh, build it south along the uh, Yellowstone River, cross over the Yellowstone where the Clark's Fork joined it and then followed the Clark's Fork River uh, all the way up to Cook City. Uh, along the way, uh, because of Red Lodge, he also proposed that he would build a branch line that would uh, cut off at approximately where Edgar is now and follow a little drainage called um, Owl Creek, I think it is, uh, uh, up and over the east bench and then drop into, uh, into Red Lodge. This, of course, was his planned route. This is a picture of the Clark's Fork Canyon, uh, just outside of Clark, Wyoming. Uh, it was, it was going to be an impressive project to build up the canyon all the way to Cook City. But uh, he finished his surveys in the summer of 1886, and uh, the Billings Gazette was pretty enthusiastic. On uh, July 5th, they published an article that said, the line is remarkable for its cheapness of construction. In the canyon, there are several miles of heavy work, though much lighter than has been encountered on almost every division of the Northern Pacific. This might have been a little bit optimistic uh, assessment at the time, but uh, it showed the enthusiasm people had for it. A congressional report written two years later uh, said the route is certainly a practicable one and one of great utility to the entire country when constructed. So there was a uh, there was some enthusiasm for, for Gallagher's project. But there was a competition. There were other people with, with this kind of idea in mind. And one of them was a company called the Rocky Fork and Cook City Railway Company. Uh, this company was set up by uh, coal speculators mainly. Uh, one of them was Sam Word. He was a, uh, an attorney out of Butte. Uh, he had partners from Iowa to uh, coal mine uh, developers, a guy named James Platt, and another one named Hamilton Brown from Iowa. He also partnered up with a businessman from uh, Bozeman named Walter Cooper. And they had one other partner, I can't think of his name, out of uh, St. Paul. But anyway, there were five of them, and uh, they formed this company called the Rocky Fork in Cook City. Uh, they also formed a company called the Rocky Fork Coal Company, and uh, they acquired most of the coal lands here around Red Lodge uh, in the uh, early 1880s. Uh, their plan you know, for their company was to start in Laurel rather than Billings and uh, follow Rock Creek all the way to Red Lodge. Uh, beyond that, they also said, proposed that they were going to build an extension that would take them to Cook City uh, their extension to Cook City was going to follow the mountain front, as you can see, to the northwest, uh, to a point called Nye City, which is uh, about where the uh, Stillwater Mine is now. And uh, from there, they would turn down the uh, Stillwater River drainage and follow that up to Cook City. Uh, 
uh, everyone knew though that uh, their real uh, goal was just to get to the coal mine, the coal lands here in, uh, in Red Lodge. And because, uh, because of that, they never actually surveyed anything beyond Red Lodge. And so having done that, they were able to get their paperwork into the federal government uh, ahead of Phil Gallagher's group. Uh, Phil's group had actually surveyed the entire line to Cook City, so they had a considerably uh, a lot more work to do. But, uh, but uh, Platt and his group got their paperwork in, and their right of way across the Crow Reservation, Red Lodge, was approved by Congress uh, in uh, March of 1887. Uh, the only real stipulation with that approval was that they had two years to, uh, to get the railroad built. So uh, they moved ahead right away. The other thing they had to accomplish before they could do anything was they had to reach an agreement with the Crow tribe. Uh, the federal government had given them permission, but they still had to work out uh, compensation uh, for the tribe. They were going to, their right away would remove about uh, around 900 acres of, of tribal land. <clears throat> and so they worked out a deal and, and agreed to pay the tribe $2 an acre uh, for the land that they were going to be using. Uh, so getting back to the point, one of Yankee Jim's partners uh, who had sold uh, some of the coal land here to, uh, to Platt's group uh, asked him what inducements they'd need to extend the line to Cook City. And Platt replied that all he needed was for the mine owners to agree to give the road in their business. No bonus, no subsidies, nothing but patronage is requested. But a few days later, Platt admitted to MP President Robert Harris, we have as yet made no survey from the coal mines to Cook and only know the nature of the route in a general way by passing over it. So this confirms City was just sort of a dream for them. But having gotten their right of way approved and, uh, and worked out a deal with the Crow tribe, uh, the, the problem that Platt's group still faced was that they didn't have money to build the railroad. So uh, their first move was to go to this guy. Uh, Sam Hauser was a past territorial governor, and he had been involved in a lot of railroad projects in the state already. And as a result of that was uh, was tied in pretty closely with the upper management of the Northern Pacific Railroad. And uh, Hauser agreed to, uh, to invest in Platt's, Platt's group's uh, uh, scheme for building the railroad at Red Lodge. And they just assumed that if Hauser was in with them, that the, the Northern Pacific would, would be supporting their project as well. And so with the, uh, with the, uh, um, two-year deadline in mind in uh, mid-1887, uh, Platt's group decided to go ahead and start construction on a railroad at Red Lodge. They, they started work on a bridge over the Yellowstone River and started grading roadbed heading south from there. That was in August. But uh, money didn't materialize from the NP. Uh, by, uh, by December, uh, Platt's syndicate had spent all their money and everything came to a halt. So they were, uh, they were in a pretty vulnerable position at that point. And uh, they were worried that Philip Gallagher's group uh, with the Billings, Clarks Fork, and Cook City would sneak in there and get the railroad built to Red Lodge before they could. Uh, so the first thing they did in January of uh, 1888 was they started a big lobbying campaign in Washington, D.C. to uh, drum up support to oppose granting Gallagher a right-of-way. Uh, the, uh, they were able to get uh, three congressmen on their side, at least. Uh, Newt Nelson, B.W. Perkins, and John McShane uh, wrote a report to Congress and said, in support, of Platt's Railroad, and they said work and enterprise should not be hampered and discouraged by Congress granting and encouraging a competing line to the same points and on nearly the same route. The undisputed fact is that one road is badly needed, a 
There is not and will not be the country being wild and unsettled business for two roads for years to come. So they had their supporters in Congress to try to uh, stop Phil Gallagher from, from supplanting their, their job, but they weren't satisfied with that. Uh, they were going to other lengths as well. Uh, Walter Cooper, one of the uh, investors in the Rocky Fork in Cook City, uh, was caught uh, bribing pro-tribal leaders, specifically Chief Plenty Coup. They uh, Supposedly he was uh, plying him with <coughs> gifts of flour and sugar to uh, try to uh, ensure that the Crow tribal leaders uh, would oppose the uh, granting of the right of way through their reservation as well. Uh, his, his efforts were probably pointless because the Crow tribe was already uh, dead set against allowing the second railroad to, uh, to cross the reservation. So that was that was in March of, uh, of 88. And so by the middle of the year, uh, there were four railroads actually proposed to get to Cook City. Um, let's see here. The first, of course, was the, uh, was the original Northern Pacific Cinnabar and Clark's Fork Railroad, which had hit Stonewall. In Congress, and then there was Phil Gallagher's Billings Clark's Fork and Cook City Railroad. There was Platt's uh, uh, Rocky Fork and Cook City that ran through here, and finally there was a road proposed uh, by a group from uh, the Minnesota Mining and Smelting Company that uh, they were mostly interested in getting to Nye City, where they thought they could develop some mining there. But they also had proposed that they would extend their line up to up the Stillwater to Cook City. So uh, mid-1888, uh, there were a lot of plans to build railroads here, but uh, nothing had yet been built. Uh, as 1888 rolled on, um, Platt Syndicate realized they were in deep trouble. They were running out of time. Their right away was going to expire uh, in early March of 89, and they still hadn't raised any money. So they went back to Sam Hauser and they, you know, they said, you know, can you help us? Can you do something to help us get this railroad built? And Sam Hauser went to this guy, Thomas Oakes, who was at that time the, the president of the Northern Pacific. And Oakes explained to him that uh, the Northern Pacific's policy is to oppose the building of any lines connecting with our main line unless we have control thereof and absolute ownership. So that was the reason that uh, the NP hadn't been very forthcoming with supporting the, the road to Red Lodge. But uh, Hauser took this information back to Platt and explained to him uh, what the Northern Pacific's position was and uh, put a little pressure on him. Platt really didn't have any choice at that time. Uh, uh, Hauser told him, you're going to have to sell out controlling interest in the railroad and all of your coal land uh, to me, Hauser. And if you do that, then I can promise you that I'll be able to bring in uh, investors that can supply enough money to get the railroad built. So I don't know what kind of a deal Platt and his guys uh, ultimately agreed to, but they agreed to some kind of a deal. And uh, they sold out to Hauser, and uh, Hauser brought in investors, one of the first of whom was Marcus Daly uh, with the Anaconda Copper Company. And then uh, other people, like Thomas Oakes, invested their money personally in the project. And the interesting thing about the story is that the Northern Pacific Railroad never invested any money in the project. Uh, people like Oakes, the president of the company, did. And his cronies, the other upper management and guys on the board of directors, all invested money in the project. And the reason they did that is because they knew once they built the railroad, they could get the Northern Pacific to buy it from them. And they'd all make a good profit off of the deal. So it was, uh, that was the way business was done back in the 1880s. So these guys profited off the deal, and, uh, and their stockholders paid the price. <laughs> so uh, the railroad did get built uh, from Laurel down here to Red Lodge. Uh, they were in a squeeze place. Hauser didn't have enough money until about August of 88. And, uh, so he was trying to get this railroad built during winter months. Uh, it said that uh, in the end, he, he was just uh, 
he was in such a hurry to get the tracks to Red Lodge before the deadline that they were just knocking down the sagebrush and laying the uh, ties and rails directly on the dirt just so they could say that they had the rails into Red Lodge before the deadline. <clears throat> and they did manage to do that. I think they got here uh, just less than a week before the uh, congressional approval expired. So with the railroad finished, of course, that allowed development of the coal mining here. And, uh, uh, Red Lodge became one of the largest coal producing areas of the state at the time. Uh, most of the production went to the NP for their locomotives, but uh, some was shipped to the smelters in Butte, Anaconda, and elsewhere. Uh, by 1896, uh, the mines were producing 232,000 tons a year, and, and peak production was reached uh, about 1917 when they were producing over a million tons a year at a Red Lodge. Well, all of this, you think, might have discouraged somebody like Philip Gallagher, and it did discourage his partners, because once the road was finished to Red Lodge, uh, their plans for their branch kind of went down the drain, and, uh, and Philip Gallagher's partners all dropped out. And, uh, but Phil Gallagher wasn't, going to, wasn't ready to quit or give up. Uh, he just needed a new partner. And in 1889, he found that partner, uh, a guy named Elijah Smith. Uh, Elijah was a financier out of Boston. Uh, he had been in the coal business for a long time in the East and then uh, had branched out. He was actually a, an associate of Henry Villard, the guy that built the uh, Northern Pacific. And uh, they had worked together on uh, coal mines and railroads in the state of Washington. And so there was an association with them there. Uh, I'll touch on this a little further uh, later in the talk, but in 1889, uh, Elijah Smith was looking for another project to get involved in, and so he ended up partnering up with Philip Gallagher. And the first thing they did was they formed a new company called the Montana and Wyoming Railroad Company. Now, this was essentially the same proposed railroad that that the Billings, Clarks Fork, and Cook City was. In fact, Gallagher uh, actually was able to transfer the right-of-way approval uh, for the one railroad to the new company. And uh, the plan that they had for this railroad was therefore pretty similar. They were still going to start in Billings. They were going to build the line up the Clarks Fork Valley and on into Cook City. Uh, they no longer needed to build a branch to Red Lodge, but their new plan was that they would build a branch uh, of the Bear Creek Valley. And the reason for this is that in conjunction with, uh, with uh, starting up the new railroad project, uh, Philip Gallagher and uh, Elijah Smith, along with Elijah's East Coast investors, people from the Boston area and New York, uh, had set up a new company called the Montana Coal and Iron Company. And they had gone into the Bear Creek Valley and picked up about uh, 3,000 acres of pretty prime looking coal property along Bear Creek. And uh, so their new plan was not only to build a railroad to Cook City, but also to develop coal mining in the Bear Creek area. Uh, the problem that they still faced with this whole plan was, as you can see there in 1889, uh, they were still faced with getting permission from the Crow tribe to uh, construct their railroad, and the Crow were still not interested in allowing a railroad there. But they knew, uh, Smith and, and uh, Gallagher knew that the federal government was again in negotiations with the tribe uh, and trying to convince them to give up more of their reservation land. And in uh, 1890, uh, the, the government negotiators succeeded to convince the Crow to give up another 1.8 million acres, virtually everything that's shaded on the map there. And uh, once that, once that uh, concession was given, then the uh, roadblock against railroad construction, that is to say the, uh, the tribal resistance to it, would go away. So they were willing to, uh, to plan this railroad with that in mind. But uh, unfortunately for them, the U.S. Senate didn't get around to ratifying the, uh, the treaty until the October of 1892. And uh, before uh, 
before Smith could do anything as far as railroad construction, the financial panic of 1893 hit the country and uh, investment dollars disappeared. There were bank failures and <clears throat> there was a, uh, a long-term depression fell in. So things looked kind of bleak at that point. Uh, Elijah Smith went back to whatever he was doing in Boston and uh, Philip Gallagher took a job with the federal government surveying the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park and everything quieted down for about a year. But again, Phil Gallagher wasn't a guy to give up. He, uh, he came back from the National Park Survey in uh, 1894 and he had a new plan. He had a year to think about it. And uh, starting a railroad in Billings no longer made any sense to him. So in, in 1894, Phil's new plan was that we should start a railroad at Rockvale. <coughs> he was going to build the main line south out of Rockvale again following the Clark's Fork, but he was going to go ahead and extend that into the Bighorn Basin in, uh, in Wyoming. He saw potential for agricultural development down there. And then he was going to still going to build his branch line of Bear Creek to, to the Montana coal and iron properties there. And he still had plans for a 40-mile branch uh, to Cook City. So this was his new plan as of 1894. He, uh, he spent a lot of time kind of trying to promote this and raise money. Uh, in a July 1st article in the Billings Gazette, he said that there exists no doubt in the mind of anyone at all familiar with the camp, but what the Cook City District could supply enough good ore to give a railroad a profitable business from the start. And that the region encouraged by railroad development would rapidly develop and speedily become one of the most noted mining camps in the world. He went on to say, you know, a railroad would obtain a huge share of travel to that wonderland of America for nowhere throughout the whole park or Rocky Mountain region is there more picturesque scenery to be found than along, along the Clark's Fork River. So Phil was enthusiastic about this and was working hard to, to find the investors to support this scheme, but, uh, but nothing came of it. Uh, the, the Depression panic of 1893 was still having an effect on the country, and, and uh, Phil just didn't really get anywhere with this whole proposal. So uh, after waiting it around for a couple of years, in 1896, uh, he and Elijah Smith decided that uh, the only way they were going to get a railroad to their property was to convince the Northern Pacific to do it. And with that in mind, uh, they opened up a small mine at Bear Creek and, uh, and dug out 100 tons of the best looking coal they could find. And they shipped that to the Northern Pacific for testing, uh, trying to convince them that Bear Creek coal was actually better than the coal they had at Red Lodge. And thinking that they could get, get uh, the, the NP enthused about it. Uh, they sent the sample to uh, this guy, John W. Kendrick. He was chief engineer at the time, second vice president of the NP. And, and Kendrick, they tested the coal, and they were impressed. Uh, it turns out uh, Bear Creek coal actually was a little bit better than Red Lodge coal in a number of ways. And, uh, and he was interested in it. And, he, in fact, immediately sent out a crew to see if it was possible to extend the tracks from Red Lodge here over the East Bench and then drop down into the Bear Creek Valley to, uh, to tap the, the coal there. But uh, uh, it, it wasn't a practical route if you've been over the hill and try to imagine building a railroad over the Bear Creek from here. Uh, and Philip Gallagher knew that. And he immediately uh, pointed that out to uh, to Kendrick that the only reasonable way to get at the Bear Creek Coal was to build a railroad up, up the Clark's Ford Valley. Uh, Gallagher was still enthused about it, and he told Kendrick uh, in an August 1896 letter that if we can combine our forces, and there's no reason why we should not, we can control the coal trade of Montana and the Dakotas to our mutual benefit. So he's trying to appeal to Kendrick and the Northern Pacific's uh, uh, Monopolistic, <laughs> sorry, yeah, 
monopolistic tendencies. But uh, I don't know what, what Kendrick thought about it, but building a railroad from Rockvale uh, all the way to Bear Creek was a long ways to build a railroad, and the NP uh, just really didn't have the money at the time to do that. And uh, on top of that, uh, they actually had plenty of coal already. They were getting a lot of coal out of Red Lodge, and they still had two mines operating on Bozeman Pass, the Mountainside Mine and the Chestnut Mine, just outside of Bozeman, were still in full operation for the NP. So the NP didn't really need the coal, and uh, they were not very inclined to spend the money to build that line to, to get a, yet another coal deposit. But there were other people around who did need coal, and uh, one of those guys is this guy, William Andrew Clark. Uh, he was one of the Copper Kings of Butte, banker and a financier. And uh, by the late 1890s, uh, uh, Clark, along with uh, Marcus Daly and the Anaconda Company and others, were looking for more coal. And, uh, and luckily for them, uh, the Crow Session of 1892 had allowed the opening of yet another coal field. And the coal field that had opened up due to that uh, change was, was one that ran from uh, up near Joliet, uh, through the hills, uh, just west of Fromberg, and then the, the hills west of Bridger. And there was coal through that whole entire area. So uh, everybody was after it. Uh, Clark went in there and picked up a, a block of coal land west of Bridger. Uh, a guy named Sam Jabot uh, picked up the, the land west of what would be Fromberg. And Marcus Daly and the Anaconda Company uh, grabbed a, a block of coal land up between Joliet and Boyd. So Anaconda was the first to, to be able to make a move. They, their land up by Boyd was just off of the Northern Pacific's, what's called the, the Rocky Fork Branch, what used to be the Rocky Fork and Cook City Railroad, is now part of the Northern Pacific. And uh, their mine was just off the railroad. The, the problem with the Anaconda's operation at, at Carbonado was that the coal was over 900 feet deep. And they had to excavate a 980 foot, foot deep vertical shaft to get down to the coal. Uh, so the coal was hard to get at, but the transportation was right there. The, uh, the thing that faced uh, William Clark was he had the coal, the coal at Fromberg and Bridger crops out at the surface, but they didn't have a railroad. So uh, they needed a way to transport it. And uh, to deal with that, uh, Clark went to this guy. This is Charles Sanger Mellon. He became president of the Northern Pacific in 1897. And uh, Clark went to him and said, I need a railroad. And, Mellon said, well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but uh, Clark came back with a proposal. He said, well, here's what we're going to do. And they finally agreed to it. Clark uh, said, I'll pay for the buying the right of way. Uh, I'll pay for all the grading. I'll pay for any bridges and trestles that you need. And, uh, and then you guys can come in and lay the tracks down, uh, and we'll jointly own it. Uh, so they worked out that deal, and they worked out the same deal with Sam Jabot uh, at Fromberg. And so Jabot and, and, uh, and the Northern Pacific jointly owned the line from Silesia down to Fromberg. And then Clark and the Northern Pacific jointly owned the line from Fromberg to, Brit to Bridger. And uh, the Northern Pacific retained the right to, uh, to buy out their partners at any time at cost. So with that deal in place in 1898, Construction went ahead on, <clears throat> on what would soon be called the Clark's Fork Branch, and uh, starting at Silesia and running down to Bridger. Uh, it was completed in December of 1898. Uh, the completion of the railroad, uh, of course, allowed uh, Clark's Bridger Coal and Improvement Company to go into production at Bridger. This is a picture of their mine there just west of Bridger and uh, Sam Jabot's 
uh, mine at Colville or near Fromberg was able to go into production that way as well. But uh, Elijah Smith knew about all the dealings that, uh, that uh, Clark was having with the, with, with the NP. He knew about it and, uh, and so he, he made a similar proposal to Charles Mellon to, he said, well, you know, you're going to build this line down the bridge or why don't you just extend it on down to Bear Creek. He sent a letter to, uh, to Mellon at the beginning of 1898 and proposed that uh, uh, kind of a similar deal. He said, I'll, I'll buy the right of way, I'll do the grading, I'll build the bridges, all you guys have to do is come in and lay the tracks. Uh, the only difference with his proposal was Smith said um, uh, instead of jointly owning the line, he wanted the Northern Pacific to haul his coal for free until he recouped his investment and then he was going to uh, transfer ownership of the line 100% uh, to the Northern Pacific. So that was the proposal he made to Mellon, but Mellon didn't bother to respond to him. When the line to Bridget was finished in December of 98, Smith wrote a very conciliatory letter to, uh, to Charles Mellon saying, hey, you know, you finished that line to Bridger, I'm still here, my deal still stands, uh, you know, let's work together. And again, Mellon uh, ignored him. So, uh, so what the heck was going on? Well, we have to step back like 10 years to really understand the, uh, the history of that whole thing. Uh, I mentioned that Elijah Smith had been an associate of, uh, of uh, Henry Villard, and when Villard built the Northern Pacific, completed the Northern Pacific, he didn't actually finish the railroad all the way to the West Coast, because Villard already owned a railroad called the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, which you can see up here in red. It ran from a, <clears throat> a little town called Wallula near Pasco, Washington into Portland. And, uh, and so when Henry Villard finished the, the North NP, he just connected the, this end of the NP to his Oregon Railway and Navigation and that way he completed the road all the way into Portland. Uh, what happened, of course, as I said, Villard's financial world came crashing down at the end of 1883 and, uh, and Elijah Smith ended up stepping in and, and taking control of a lot of the assets that Villard had out on the West Coast and one of those things was the uh, Oregon Railway and Navigation Company and uh, Elijah Smith was elected president of the uh, ONR in, in 1884 and he immediately set about irritating the Northern Pacific. Uh, the first thing he did was he, uh, he built a connection. The, 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 the Union Pacific Railroad was in the process of building a railroad from down near Salt Lake up across Idaho. And uh, so one of the first things Smith did was he built a little connector line from the Oregon Railway and Navigation and he hooked himself up with the, with the Union Pacific. Uh, that put Smith in a position where he could play the Union Pacific against the Northern Pacific, he, he having the only out, outlet to the West Coast at that point. Uh, so that, that put him in not good stead with NP. And then, and then he formed a company called the Washington and Idaho Railroad and started building branch lines uh, in eastern Washington in the territory that, that the NP considered theirs. And he started competing with them for traffic in this area. Uh, the Northern Pacific was, was getting more and more irritated with them. They pushed through the completion of their, uh, their own line to the West Coast. They built a line through the Cascades here into Tacoma. And uh, as soon as they started uh, diverting their traffic to their new line in Tacoma, uh, the Elijah Smith went ahead and leased the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company to uh, to the Union Pacific. So he set up another thing where all of a sudden the NP was in direct competition with the Union Pacific. Well, none of this uh, left NP management very happy with Elijah Smith. Uh, Henry Villard uh, got his financial house in order uh, during the late 1880s and he reemerged in 1889 and uh, after kind of a contentious fight with Smith uh, 
ended up booting Smith out. And, uh, and that's why in 1889, uh, Elijah Smith was interested in getting involved with, uh, with Philip Gallagher on his uh, railroad in Montana and his coal mining projects because he, uh, he was looking for another project to work on. So that's the back history between Elijah and, uh, and the Northern Pacific. And uh, not only that, but uh, the NP had a vindictive side. Uh, uh, they not only weren't going to build a railroad or help Smith build a railroad at Bear Creek, uh, they decided they were going to put Smith out of business. And uh, so right about that same time, in 1889, Charles Mellon uh, authorized the Northern Pacific Coal Company to come into the Bear Creek Valley and start picking up available coal lands all around uh, Elijah Smith's Montana Coal and Iron Company properties. And uh, when, the, when the NP Coal Company ran out of money, uh, they got Anaconda Copper, uh, Marcus Daly's company, to come in and pick up a, a large uh, position in the Bear Creek Valley as well. And their plan was simply that uh, they now had a, had a majority position between the two of them, Anaconda and NP, and they figured if we just starve Smith out uh, with a, by not giving him a railroad, he'll eventually throw in the towel and uh, we'll buy up his land cheap and uh, we'll own all of Bear Creek uh, coal field just like we own the Red Lodge part of the coal field. So that was their plan as of the late 1890s. Uh, and it almost worked. Uh, John Kendrick, uh, uh, wrote to Charles Mellon in 1899 after talk, some of Smith's investors got cold feet, you know, knowing that this is what was going on. And they went to John Kendrick and said, hey, you know, uh, we'd be interested in selling our shares in Montana Coal and Iron. And, uh, but uh, the NP was playing hardball. They weren't going to give them anything near what the property was worth. And uh, John Kendrick uh, wrote to Charles Mellon and he told him after this meeting that he told the Smith's investors that uh, NP was willing to take the property off their hands but could get along for a great many years without it. So this was their sort of their negotiating ploy, we're just going to wait you guys out. But it really was a negotiating ploy because if, you, if I go back here you see Kendrick wrote that letter to Charles Mellon on August 12th. And uh, two days later, on the 14th, he wrote a letter to Marcus Daly and said, I shall be very much disappointed if we do not succeed in securing the Bear Creek property in the near future. So, you know, they really thought that they had the upper hand and Smith's guys were going were gonna to fold pretty quick. But uh, again, you know, Elijah Smith and Philip Gallagher weren't guys to give up early. Uh, instead of Instead of that, Smith got together and rallied his investors and told them, look, we're, we're not going to sell out cheap. We're going to fight these guys. And in, eight, in 1900, they went ahead and opened a mine in Bear Creek on their property and started shipping 6,000 tons of coal a day a year uh, over the hill here into Red Lodge and uh, shipping it out in the Northern Pacific. That was just sort of, I think, to placate his stockholders but also to show uh, Charles Mellon that he wasn't going to be pushed around. Uh, frustrated with Smith's obstinacy, uh, 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 Mellon started to feel some pressure from Anaconda after that. Uh, they had to close their, their Carbonado line up near Boyd in 1901 because the operating costs on that thousand foot deep coal mine uh, were getting too high. There was a lot of water influx into the mine and, and it just wasn't economic to operate. Uh, so they closed that mine at Carbonado in 1901 and, uh, and the Anaconda Company, which was now called Amalgamated Copper, uh, was looking for a, a place to replace the lost production from that mine. And uh, I'm sure they went to Charles Mellon and said, look, you guys had us buy all this coal land in Bear Creek and we need that coal now, and uh, so you guys need to build a railroad. And uh, in October 1902, Charles Mellon finally gave up and ordered a survey to be run from Bridger to, uh, to Bear Creek. Uh, but that's as far as that project went. 
And again, there's a backstory to all of this. Enter this guy. This is James Hill. Uh, he was an astute businessman. He was the guy that built the Great Northern Railroad, which is the line that runs along the High Line uh, through Montana now. Uh, Hill had built the Great Northern, was one of the first railroads, transcontinentals, without any government support. All previous transcontinental railroads had gotten some kind of land grants or financial support from the federal government. And Hill managed to build the Great Northern without any government input. And not only that, it was so well run that when uh, most or many railroads in the country uh, fell into bankruptcy or receivership, during the financial panic of 1893, uh, the Great Northern Railroad remained solvent and, uh, and was immune to that downturn. So uh, Jim Hill was a, was a really astute guy as far as the railroad business goes, and, uh, and he was a key player in this. Well, the, the thing that happened is that when the NP collapsed in 1893, like I said, uh, J.P. Morgan was the guy that stepped in and saved the company reorganized it, brought in new investors, and uh, having done that and renamed the company the Northern Pacific Railway instead of Railroad, you know, knowing that Morgan, knowing that he didn't know that much about running railroads, uh, brought James Hill in to help him run the company. Uh, in 1897, Morgan went out and hired Charles Mellon, and uh, Jim Hill was not at all pleased with that. Uh, Hill was of the opinion that the thing that had wrecked the Northern Pacific uh, prior to 1893 was the fact that they were building too many branch lines. Uh, they were building branch lines all over the place, and they weren't bringing in any money. It was all a money losing deal, and Jim Hill was convinced that that was the problem. And uh, when Charles Mellon took over the NP in 1897, uh, it looked to Jim Hill that Mellon was starting up and doing exactly the same thing again. And uh, one of those things he was doing was planning to build a branch line to, <clears throat> to, uh, to Bear Creek. Um, Jim Hill was not one to mince words. Uh, when he talked about Mellon, he described him to one of his associates as one of Morgan's overrated underachievers who has no business judgment more than a child and is unfit to occupy the position he does. So Jim Hill did have opinions. Uh, so, uh, Morgan, J.P. Morgan eventually gave uh, Hill full control of the Northern Pacific in 1901. And uh, one of the first things Hill did when he got control was he, he passed an edict that there would be no more branch lines built by the railroad. And they would buy no branch lines and build no branch lines. So, uh, when Charles Mellon, proposed that he was going to build a new branch line to Bear Creek in 1902. He was doing that in direct uh, conflict with Jim Hill. Uh, when Jim Hill found out about it, uh, he, in 1903, early 1903, he immediately canceled all plans for a railroad from Bridger to Bear Creek. And uh, with that having been done, uh, Charles Mellon uh, knew where he stood and he resigned as president of the Northern Pacific just a few months later. So by the middle of 1903, things were looking pretty bleak in terms of ever getting a railroad built to Bear Creek. Uh, Elijah Smith came through town in October of 03, and uh, he told the Billings Gazette that when it was asked about it, as far as he could see, the prospects for it, meaning a railroad to Bear Creek, were not of the brightest, at least so far as any immediate move in that direction was concerned. Well, this is pretty pessimistic. You know, Philip Gallagher still, <laughs> he was the undying proponent of getting this railroad built, both to Bear Creek and to Cook City. And uh, Elijah Smith's pessimistic outlook in the end of 03 was about uh, the last straw for Phil Gallagher. Uh, you could see that the NP obviously wasn't going to build the line, and, uh, and Elijah Smith wasn't going to step in and do anything. So Gallagher basically gave up on the Montana Coal and Iron Company, 
and again went out looking for a new partner. And uh, the partner that he ended up finding was this guy, uh, Christian Yagen. Uh, Chris Yagen and his brother Peter were uh, big time Billings businessmen. They owned all kinds of businesses. Uh, they owned one of the big banks in, in, uh, in Billings. They were in real estate. They were in warehousing. They had their fingers in just about everything. And uh, Phil Gallagher went to them and, uh, and convinced Christian that the next big deal was commercial coal and that the place to do it was Bear Creek. And so uh, with uh, Gallagher's encouragement, uh, Chris Yagen and uh, several other guys in Billings joined uh, with Gallagher and in November they formed the Bear Creek Coal Company uh, with the plans of developing uh, the, the coal lands in the Bear Creek Valley. Uh, Chris Yagen was enthused at the end of November here in the Billings Gazette. He said, a railroad will be built from Bridger to Bear Creek coal mines next year. There is no doubt about it. In case the Northern Pacific does not take the matter up, we have the capital guaranteed by a man who commands it to build and equip the road. It is not a matter of speculation or guesswork in regard to obtaining money. It's guaranteed by a man who lives right here in Billings and knows what these coal fields are. Well, the man who lives right here in Billings is none other than Phil Gallagher. And, uh, and they've been having so much trouble raising money to get something built. Uh, upon further reflection, it seems that Phil Gallagher finally went back to his roots in uh, southeast Pennsylvania where he had grown up and gone to school and he had gone back and talked to a bunch of small time investors there. Uh, doctors, lawyers, tobacco farmers, just all sorts of guys that he had gathered up and he had, he had convinced them that, that there was a great deal to be made by financing this railroad in Montana. So this money that he was guaranteeing was going to come from from this small group of small time investors. But what he still needed to get this whole thing done was he needed a, a manager to ramrod the whole project. And uh, then he, and knowing that, he turned to this guy. This is a guy by the name of Frank Avery Hall. Now, Frank was a young guy at the time, he was in his mid 30s, and uh, he was a Milwaukee businessman. He had uh, run a wire manufacturing business in Milwaukee, which went bankrupt in 1893. And after that, he had tried his hand at promoting whiskey distilleries. He'd come to Montana and, and tried to get people to invest in a distillery, and that didn't work out for him. But uh, in 1898, he'd come back to Montana, joined up with a couple of guys from Spokane, Washington, and they actually managed to build a well, Frank got seven miles of railroad built up on Bozeman Pass to a coal mine up there. So Frank had done a little bit in the railroad business. But uh, while he had been involved in that, the, the dream that he developed was this idea of building a, a tourist railroad that would go to Yellowstone National Park. And so uh, Gallagher made the introduction between his investors in Pennsylvania and Frank Hall. Frank Hall got together with them and uh, in 1905, they incorporated a company called the Yellowstone Park Railroad. And uh, again, their, their plan was to build a railroad from Bridger uh, to uh, Cook City and Yellowstone National Park, but uh, they would have a branch line that ran up to Bear Creek. And uh, kind of the, the, the main plan was that we'll, we'll build that line to Bear Creek, uh, we'll start hauling coal, and we'll use the cash flow from that operation to, uh, to fund the rest of the railroad uh, on it to Cook City. Well, Frank's dream was never completely fulfilled. Uh, they did get a railroad built to Bear Creek. Uh, and as we all know, there never was a railroad built to Cook City. But uh, Frank Hall's trials and travails starting in 1905 is, as they say, a story for another day. So, I will end that little presentation here, and in a moment of shameless self-promotion, I will let you know that my book, Black Diamonds from the Treasure State, has, uh, 
Patty pointed out, will be coming out in February. Uh, University of Indiana Press. Uh, later this year, you ought to be able to buy it at uh, pre-publication price uh, at their website if you're interested. So, with that, I'll open the floor to comments, questions, discussions, if any. I have two questions. Sure. Um, my first one is, I, number one, you did a wonderful presentation, so thank you for that. Oh. It was really good. Um, why were you interested in this type of work, creating this book? What prompted you to do that? And then the second question is, why do you think Gallagher was so bent on trying to get that railroad? I mean, really, was it just for his own satisfaction, or was it because you know he thought he could make it rich? I mean to keep working all that time. I know. I wish I had a... I answered the second question first. I wish I had a deeper insight into Phil Gallagher's personality and motivations. The interesting thing with Phil was that after all of it, for 20 years, you know, basically, he worked on this. And when he finally got Frank Hall involved and it looked like a railroad was going to get built, uh, Phil Gallagher just kind of drops out of the whole scene. He, uh, he worked with the Montana Coal and Iron for a little while, and then he got a cattle ranch down in Basin, Wyoming, and uh, he, he was the uh, county surveyor for Yellowstone County at the time. He had just won that position in an elect close election. He gave up the position of, of county surveyor, moved to Basin, Wyoming, and, uh, and never really had any involvement again. He ended up uh, dying in Azusa, California, of all places. Uh, years later. So I really don't know, you know, but clearly he was a determined guy. Uh, the story behind the book is kind of goofy and crazy, but uh, I've, uh, I've always been afflicted with an interest in railroads. And, uh, and years ago, uh, I found out that, that, that a railroad had run the Bear Creek. I had no idea what, one of my first times there. And, uh, and it was just like, oh, okay, you know, and I hadn't really thought about it again. Uh, until somebody told me they were going to tear down the engine house in, in Belfry. And I was like, oh, there's an engine house in Belf Belfry, you know? So I went down there and I started getting real interested in, well, what was this railroad? Why was there an engine house in Belfry and all that? And at first I didn't think it would amount to anything, but the more research I did, you know, it, it just got to be a more and more fascinating story, and especially the part that I wasn't able to talk about tonight, when you get into the whole story of Frank Hall and all of the things that happened to him while he was trying to, to build the railroad in Bear Creek, it, it, just, uh, it just ended up being fascinating and carrying me on. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, you showed a picture in there of the Jibo mine. Yeah. Um, and it had railroad tracks in front of it. Yeah. So now Jibo's pretty far off of the highway down there. Where'd those tracks go, do you know? Well, they have, yeah, well, they, they, they the main line ran right through Fromberg like it does now. Right. And there was a big loop came out of Fromberg and climbed up the hill to Colville where the mine was. So there was like a, a, a spur track basically that came off at Fromberg and ran up to there. Okay. So that's how the tracks got up to the mine. Cool. I've been wondering about that. Yeah. I always wonder, oh, excuse me, why didn't they just build it? like a tramway from Bear Creek up over to Red Lodge. It's, it's so close, you know, it's high. Yeah. But you'd think they could have done something like that instead of all this. All of this, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, they were moving a lot of coal out of there during, during the heyday. I don't know whether you could transport enough it. coal fast enough, you know, whether that would be a practical way to move that kind of coal, you yeah. know. I, I've never thought about it. I've never looked into it, so I, I really don't know the answer. So close yeah. yet, so yeah, far yeah, away. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, do, you, do you have any idea? Um, you said that uh, Red Lodge peaked out about a million tons of coal a year that, uh, out in mm -hmm. their production. Do you know what the peak was in Bear Creek? Was, was it more? He, he, no. Uh, I, think, I think the peak year at Bear Creek was probably 1944 either 43 or 44, and it was about 577,000 tons. So about half of what, the, and at that point, in the 40s, uh, you were really down to, uh, to just two mines 
uh, over in Bear Creek. I mean, the big operation was Montana Coal and Iron, uh, the Smith Mine until until the explosion in '43, and then everything transferred over to the Fo Foster Gulch Mine uh, there. But uh, for World War II, the production was way up, and it was something just less than 600,000 tons a year, I think. The only other mine at that time was was the Brophy Mine up uh, up Virtue Gulch over there. Thank you. Was the spur from uh, from Billings to uh, to Red Lodge or Laurel to Red Lodge? Was that narrow gauge? I think I heard that once. No, uh, it was standard gauge from the start. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.